and welcome to the Strong Men Podcast. So many of us men have got it wrong. In our attempts to be strong, we end up fragile, fake and weak. Our current understanding of what it means to be a strong man is warped. This misunderstanding almost led to my suicide and it continues to contribute towards the high suicide rate seen in men. That's why the Strong Men Podcast is on a mission. A mission to redefine the strong man. To help men grasp true strength and work towards it. Not just to keep them on the planet a little longer, but to help them thrive. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Strong Men Podcast. With me, Chris Stone, this is the final episode of the first series. And I'm sure you're you're gutted about that. You've really been enjoying all of these episodes thus far. And you've made sure to give the podcast a rating and review as well. So yes, it's sad that this first season is coming to a close, but don't worry, there is more in the offing. And I'm getting ahead of myself because we still have one amazing interview to come. I'm literally just off a call with Reese Byrne, who is this week's guest. I've really been looking forward to interviewing Reese. Um, he's got a really interesting story and he's also like me a personal trainer working in the fitness industry and we share quite a lot in common when it comes to the fitness industry and our approach with clients which we'll touch on in the interview you'll hear very shortly. Also in the interview we spend some time to reflect on his experiences with epilepsy. We cover a range of other topics as well. The conversation really flowed nice and easy because as I say we have these shared interests when it comes to physical training and psychology in particular. I will say though, Reese is studying psychology at the moment, so his knowledge is far and away. It far and away exceeds mine, as you would expect. So he's got some really good insight and knowledge that he shares with you in this interview. I mean, no doubt you're going to gain a lot from it. You're going to enjoy hearing from from him and hearing what he has to say. So let's get into this final interview, and it is a belter. Welcome to the Strong Men Podcast. Today we have Reese joining us, and this is the final episode of this series. So I'm delighted to have Reese on. Reese, how are you? You having a good day so far? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'm having a good day, especially. Good to see you. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Reese, I reached out to you a while ago um to get you on the podcast. I've been very keen to to have you join us because uh, you're someone who's also in the fitness industry, so I'm sure you're going to have lots of really helpful insight and you, I know the work that you do and I'm very interested to to know a little bit more about it. But before we get into all of that, I was just wondering if you could just take a little second or two to introduce yourself and give people a bit of background about you. Okay, so my name's Reese Byrne. Uh, at the moment, I'm a personal trainer, an online coach. And like Chris, my philosophies and tenets are orientated towards helping the mental side through fitness and activity. My study in my spare time is to do with entering into the mental health side, so psychology with counselling, where I'm then going to have some consideration whether to orient towards the mental health, psychology, psychiatry side or the sports psychology, which for some odd reason I didn't even realise it was a thing until last year. So my personal motto or tenet I use is helping those inexorably become a better version of themselves. And the motto with this is sort of rooted in a humanistic psychology setting. So I am helping the individual get towards a state of congruence where they're happy with themselves because they have the power. It's not me, I can set a plan, but they have the power to help change their lives and become you know, a, a greater version of themselves. And that's really what I try to emphasize through my work at the moment. Great. Well, as I say, thanks so much for joining. I've been very much looking forward to, to this interview. I was just wondering to begin with, could you give us a little bit of an idea of how you actually ended up going into the fitness industry? <laughs> Overall, it's a fortunate result from an unfortunate circumstance. So I've been sort of orientated towards fitness through youth. I've been lifting uh, weights and in a bodybuilding or powerlifting side for 12 years. However, one of the fundamentals that's influenced my life is the disability epilepsy 
So I ended up in a coma due to my epilepsy training for a fitness competition. Now, at that point, I was in a job as a designer that I did not like. It was filled with great people, but a nine to five job in an office desk doing something that I am not motivated for, not even extremely motivated for. So motivated for money or reward. It was just, I don't even know how to orientate it. It's not humiliating, but not really true to myself. And it had a horrendous impact of stress on my mental health. So after that happened, due to my epilepsy, I was in the situation of, I've got my degree that I'm trying to do that I love. What should I do as a job that I like to enjoy as well? So volunteering in my spare time, I help with a mental health charity called Mikey's Line. So the reason that I'm saying that is I have a lot of one-to-one in helping people who are in distress. So the component or fundamentals is I like helping people become better versions of themselves. I was already interested in fitness anyway, so I thought, well, here we go. I may as well go for that. And it's quite ironic or somewhat contradictory. I was laughing that I ventured in this because I was always under the opinion that those who do fast track courses aren't, I don't want to say suitable, but I'd had um, a bit of a stick towards it. I was open, but I had a bit of iffy opinion towards it, which was actually more beneficial because it, instead of likewise, a lot of us in the fitness industry, we like to say what we don't like instead of saying what we learn. So we're very niggly about things we dislike, but we're never open about what we're learning along the journey. So in simple terms, it made me shut up and actually listen. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I personally think the fitness industry is better with with coaches like you in it. Um, the 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 biggest, you know, I feel personally, um, and I, I I'm trying to be more positive about the fin- fitness industry, but we were talking a little bit about the fast track courses and that sort of stuff, um, and you know, people can become a personal trainer quite quickly. Um, I'd certainly see that as a positive or a negative because in a positive t- sense, it gets people on that career. And if they're re- really, really passionate about it, then that's obviously a really good thing. My concern around that is that in some instances, it's almost like you complete your course and that's it. You know, the learning stops. Once people have their qualification, it's almost like, okay, now I, I know everything I need to know and that's it. Whereas uh, what differ- differentiates really good PTs from perhaps not so good ones are the ones who are aware that they are lacking certain knowledge in certain areas and perhaps they they need to maybe go away and there's that desire to learn more in order to help their clients something we can chat about as well what's i think quite hard for us and that is (laughs) one of the benefits of being through traumatic times of mental health is it gives you a lot of knowledge of some what's genuine and what's not. So you can tell if people within this industry are marketing it for business ideas. You and I, we are very person-centered and we do it for the individual. And we love to help others with mental health. And having that genuine desire to help others, I think is what makes the best personal trainers because they're focused on the clients. And that doesn't mean you don't focus on yourself. Like altruistic thought, altruism's a fantastic value. And when used in the right way, it's hugely brilliant. Perspective plays a big part, though, because contrarily, you can make the argument that there's no such thing as altruism. So finding genuine and authentic, intuitive personal trainers, using your values to do your work is something that I heavily try to employ. I'll be honest, um, and this is part of the reason that I I often get a bit frustrated sometimes with the, with the some of the fitness industry. There have been a number of clients that I've worked with over the years where we've almost had to go back and pick up the pieces from their previous experiences with other PTs, and from my perspective, that does come down to to exactly what you're saying, like. It's the, the, the coach that they've worked with in the past is only interested in themselves. So, for example, they're only interested in getting that good before and after shot that they can use to market 
to get more people in and get more money. But as you're saying, the the PTs that you should definitely be be working with are the ones that are more invested in you and getting your results rather than their own business. Like, yes, of course, it's important to me to make enough money that I can do my work, but ultimately my clients come first and I need to make sure that I'm providing a service that works for them. Something that I, I, I say quite often to clients is like, I don't want to add to your stress. Like, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to, to sort of ideally help with that stress i'm not saying take it away it's not my responsibility to do that but i'm there as a support to help you through those times i don't ever want to add significant pressure or stress to your already stressful life so um yeah it's really important for anyone who's listening if they're they're ever considering working with a pt that you actually get to understand what they are like in the same way that it's important for a coach to really understand you and get you as well yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, I think an analogy I can put there, a coach is someone who lets you or is purely focused on you holding the trophy at the end, mm. not you holding the trophy in the photo. Nice, yeah, I like that. So you've touched upon the disability and also your work with people at Mikey's Line, which is amazing and I'm sure very, very rewarding. Have those experiences shaped you and, and kind of um, encouraged you down that route or what is it perhaps that gives you a desire to to go down the psychology route? So this specific goal was a result in experiences I had in the last eight to nine years. So epilepsy is only one component that's particularly affected my mental health. Within the last eight years, there's quite a lot of stuff many know and others don't. So severely struggling with depression, anxiety and as a consequence, it led me into a lot of existentialism and philosophical thinking. Now, what I mean by that, I was really high in suicidal ideation. Why that's different than being suicidal is I would never try it. I actually realized I would never attempt to take my own life when I was doing a bungee jump. And the love I had for family and friends was, was too much to do something like that. So. In relation to your question, I think a fundamental with anyone who is in the mental health setting is they either have had mental health experiences themselves or it's been loved ones and someone close to them. So a family member of mine is schizophrenic. That is orientated from from childhood as much of these conditions do into my life. It's affected from a young age. From there, my own mental health experiences with through in and out with epilepsy is deeply impacted minds. And the analogy that I always used to use was limbo. So being put into a false dichotomy, whether it's only taking your life or sitting in hell. Black or white, if you compare this to the fitness industry, it's almost like a all or nothing mindset. So you've put yourself into this self-sabotaged X or Y way out. And at that point, there was no other way for me to really do things for myself. I thought the best thing I could do at this time was live for other people and go down this route. What that is, is almost a part of extrinsic motivation, which is, in some regards, doing a path or task, if you like, for a reward but mainly I was doing things for other people and not myself, which is intrinsic. So I, I rooted towards doing this because it was something that I loved and I really had a interest in doing it. So, yeah, there's, there's more to it. In the last year, I found out I've had pretty much ADHD as well. So the reason that I'm saying this is structure has been something and achieving results and potential has been a very big challenge. Never really had an idea why. So at this point in life, I feel like I'm in a situation now where I can really do something I enjoy. Thank you for that. It's, uh, yeah, it gives everyone a, a good idea of, you know, your your own experience and how that's that experience has shaped you. And it is so often the case, isn't it, when um, someone is, is impacted either personally or uh, directly, or as, as you say, someone they know has struggled with their mental health or a mental health illness and it kind of does 
almost plant a seed of like, okay, this has impacted me and therefore I want to go and help others or who are in a similar situation. You know, that's clearly the experience for you and it's exactly the same for me as well. I was wondering if you were comfortable and happy to share a little bit about uh, your experiences with epilepsy. Now, if I'm honest, it's not something that I know a lot to a lot about and to my uh, to my own shame, I guess. <laughs> it's something that I, I could do with being more aware of, certainly. Uh, but I see this as a really good opportunity to do exactly that. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what epilepsy actually is, because I'm aware there's probably a lot of misunderstandings around epilepsy. And also just generally your your experiences and how it impacts you. So epilepsy is it's a neurological disorder. Disorder is a word I don't like to use, but um, derivation, that's what it is, where it affects the connections within your brain. Now, one of the stereotypical notions or points that people have is if I just whip out a light, you're going to have a seizure fall over photosensitive and it's actually only one that's quite rare photosensitive epilepsy so epilepsy is actually with regards to seizure it's very common and not so common at the same time so the seizures that everyone knows are what's defined as tonic clonic which is two phases so your muscles will tense up you'll jerk you'll howl it's like a wolf and you'll fall over and spasm on the floor so the circuit ray in your brain just clicks. There's also a myriad of different types of seizures. One that's quite common in children, which is focal seizures, or petite mal, used to be called. That's essentially like a daydream, except you're unaware it's happening. So if we were having a conversation right now, six seconds could go by where I'd pause like this, and then I'd come back in it, not realising what happened, but I might be able to tell because of your facial expressions. There's quite a lot of children, I say quite a lot, I don't know statistics, but it's often, more often than not, a lot of children grow out of it. I didn't. So mine's was absent seizures, which they think, surprisingly, that it could have been because it was premature. Epilepsy can be caused from injuries. It could be genetic factors that you're born with it. And then when I was 18, I sort of developed into a generalised epilepsy, which affects different parts of the brain all over. My personal opinion, which I think is the most... How do I articulate it? Soul-destroying symptom with epilepsy is the detrimental effects it has on taking your freedom away. Now, the seizures and tongue biting and things, they physically can ruin you. But the freedom that epilepsy takes away is almost like a retractable dog leash, personal issues with family, being able to look after a child, and what you can and can't do. So driving is one thing. And the probability of having a seizure is another thing. So you can do this, you can do that, but you're never going to really know whether you're going to have a seizure and the results from it, unless you have an aura. So auras within epilepsy, they're a feeling, um, a bit of intuition that you're going to have a seizure. Some have it, some don't. So for example, if somebody knows they're going to have a seizure, they'll go, right, they're going to have one. I'm going to go lie down. Because there's not much you can do if you're in a seizure. In fact, there's nothing. Apart from waiting until they have it, make sure there's no sharp objects. But you can't put anything in their mouth. You can't touch them. And yeah, what I briefly touched on earlier about the lack of freedom that epilepsy gives you and can take away, that also corroborates over into what to do when you have a seizure because people just sit there and watch. You can't do anything. It's powerless. One of the most soul-destroying or hardest things I've had to deal with epilepsy in the coma that I was in was something called post-ectal psychosis. So I've I've had psychosis. Now, post-ectal, what that is, is a phase after a seizure where the individual will have no idea where they are. They won't be there. They can even become violent, can't walk, because you've tensed all your muscles far more than you do in a bodybuilding competition. The muscles you don't even know are working, that you're exhausted. You might bite through your tongue, like I have, 
many a time. Front four teeth are dentures because I used to like headbutting concrete during a seizure, which is lovely. Effectively, what happens during a seizure, you're going into a shock. So your brain's getting fried. You know what electroconvulsive uh, therapy is. It's equivalent of that, but internal. So I had what's known as cluster seizures. So a few in a repetitive amount of time. The post psychosis, the things that I seen, I don't remember, but I got told after. It's horrible. So I thought I was dead. It took about eight of them to hold me down. And what they do with psychosis in that situation is they try to keep repetitively waking you up to see if you're still a bit psychotic. And the worst part for me was having an idea of brief consciousness that something wasn't there. It's like a vivid dream. I was like, this isn't right. I kept trying to fight and screaming, I'm not going to die. Because what I was saying was my son screaming, don't go away, daddy. So these, this is quite vivid descriptions I'm talking about here, but I'm very open with it. It's one of the side effects of epilepsy. And thank God for the doctors and things after that, because they were wonderful. Summarising my journey, uh, which I find quite hard to do because I don't actually like talking about myself a lot, which is quite contradictory <laughs> considering I've been through my own story. Um, anxiety and depression, antidepressants, disability of epilepsy and just in mental health symptoms that affected me for years, suicidal ideation, post psychosis, and I've been through a lot. The crux is that you find a way to extrapolate what you can and to move pragmatically forwards with. So that, that's the same, sorry. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time to share all of that. Um, it's something I've said before in these episodes. I, I think it's such a good thing for people to talk about their their stories. Um, it's not, as you say, not necessarily the most easy thing to do. But what I also recognize is the power in the story because there will undoubtedly be people listening who, who, do, who can relate to certain things that you've shared today. And for them to know that they're not potentially the only person who's been there and um, to almost feel validated in their experience. Because I know when you feel like that, or certainly when I felt like that, it can become incredibly isolating to the point that you do think, look, I'm seeing everybody else getting on with life and seemingly things are going well. And why do people not seem to have the same battles and struggles that I do? But then to hear you know, someone like yourself coming on and being so raw and open and sharing all of those those really tough things just gives people a bit of perspective. And, and as I say, some can definitely relate to a lot of the stuff that, that you've talked about. One of the many quotes that helped me in a time, particularly in times of distress. So Nisha, who's quite a controversial, with a very interesting background, one of his many quotes that I liked was, suppose I have the key to your chains. Why should your lock and my lock be the same? Now, what that essentially means is we all have our mental health issues and there is many symptoms, many events will be through it similar to others and not similar. But what it effectively means is what will help me might not help you and it is not supposed to fix you. So communicating with each other is one of the biggest parts. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's a really good quote as well. It really does kind of sum everything up really well uh, in terms of what we're we're chatting about here. You did touch there on the the challenges with fitness and, and obviously now trying to run your own PT business and that sort of stuff as well must be incredibly challenging. So yeah, you I was wondering if you wanted to to maybe elaborate a little bit on on what that's been like or or the the um the particular challenges I guess when it comes to fitness and epilepsy. So I'm taking a a breath to think because there's so many different pathways that it affects, but it's also important to note that exercise is unbelievably beneficial for the brain neurologically. The event itself is something I've learned a lot from. Because there is one argument that I put myself into through rigorous training and trying so hard to achieve a goal. 
if you're going down a competitive route like I was, aspects like prep or if there's the bodybuilding scene with PEDs that can impact it hugely. My causation of seizures, if you like, is through stress, lack of sleep, dehydration. Another interesting part with fitness is carbohydrates produce such a high stimulus to the brain. So there's quite a lot of people with epilepsy who go orientate towards a ketogenic diet because with less carbs, there's less neurological activity. If you pack about 100 to 200 grams of carbs in you, you'll see how wired you are along with caffeine. So that's quite an interesting fact that quite a lot may not know to do with epilepsy. From a business standpoint, the whole marketing and focusing on structure is something that I struggle with. So why I'm really happy to see your face in this podcast, I articulate type and write things far better than I speak one-to-one, things like this. So trying to keep up with this marketing and structure, get things on time, very slow and that's a result of the seizures and the medication a lot of the medications used they can be used for those who are bipolar and why i'm saying that is it slows you down so exercise as a fundamental helps encourage and enhance neuroplasticity with a lot of the neurotransmitters in your brain so the benefits of exercise are increasing neurotransmitters like serotonin norepinephrine your GABA receptors uh, endorphins and something that you'll know about as well the BDNF factor like brain derived neurotropic factor which is a myokine I think or a neurotropic that's essentially like steroids for the brain and through doing strength training hip training any form of exercise dramatically increases these neurotransmitters and this is the important part a lot of these neurotransmitters are what targeted by SSRIs or antidepressants. So why would we be taking a pill if there's so much lifestyle factors we can do naturally first? One of the comments that you said to me that you liked that I said was pills without skills. And the point of that relating to what we're on about just now is when you have or suspected of having depression, anxiety, and they give you these pills, it almost feels like it's a last resort. Because if we look at it contrarily, the GP has a little option because of waiting times to be seen for actually learning and developing autonomy and having a plan to move forwards is so long that if they did not do something, they would be the ones in trouble. I mean, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, effectively. So using physical activity, exercise, goal setting, behavior change, we can do a week by week basis. We can pick lifestyle factors which are a more natural approach and we can try and build upon evolving, if you like, become the better version of ourselves that we know we can be. And despite any disability you may have or events that inevitably happen in your life, you have the power to change. It's something that I've grown to kind of understand more recently. And, you know, when I, I consider my own experience, it was a case of I went to the GPs. I told them how I was feeling um, in terms of, of low mood and also suicidal ideations. And the first protocol was, right, OK, here's some antidepressants. And when things began to improve and get better, I always thought like these these the, the medication kind of changed the chemistry in my brain but my lifestyle changed greatly like I moved I moved to a different country for a short period of time I came back and I changed jobs I moved into a different flat and um yeah there was so many change oh socially that was the big one like socially I became almost like a different person I was putting myself out there and, and making sure I was connecting with other people in a way that I simply wasn't doing beforehand so that kind of opened my eyes a little bit like I'm in no doubt that for me anyway that the, the medication certainly kind of almost turned the dial down a little bit on the symptoms that I was experiencing and maybe it allowed me to make these changes but it wasn't the case as far as I'm aware that the the medication changed anything in my brain um to the point that it kind of like fixed me if you want to use that kind of terminology which i probably did use at that point that's not to say obviously i, I would always encourage people to talk to their 
GPs and doctors and that sort of thing first and foremost. Uh, that should be the first port of call. I'm probably branching out to different things because there's things I'll remember to say, mm-hmm. but this is my first podcast and how I think is very sporadic. I'm amazed that this is your first podcast because you do come across very eloquent. You've, you've got a, a wide vocabulary, which surprises <laughs> me, actually, if, if you're a man from Wick. That's right, aren't you? You're from Wick. <laughs> no. Yeah, I am. I am. Lovely place. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say much. I was born in Wick as well. So. Ah, um, I thought you said yeah. you're from Thurso. I Well, I say I'm, I'm actually from Castletown, but um, you know, no one's ever heard of Castletown, so I say Thurso because it's the closest place. i just leave the chat. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, you're coming across really well. Um, and you're talking about me perhaps coming across quite anxiously, but I, certainly from my perspective, that's... It's not been reflected in in what you're saying. I think uh, you conveyed things very eloquently and and yeah, made the point well. So yeah, I really appreciate you taking time to do that. Well, I'll put in here you mentioned about eloquent. My vocabulary and verbal dictionary, if you like, has expanded a lot. Now, one of the ways that that happened was from doing this degree because you have to write a lot of essays, and one of the biggest parts as well that you'll know we're combating symptoms of mental health or dealing through a lot of therapies is learning to write that stuff down. And a lot of the times you can't find the words to say. So this is why you open up, try and find a word that actually fits it for once instead of writing it all down. So through doing English properly, but I mean properly is I failed a lot of my exams. So in doing potential and learning new courses again, I felt I was in a position to really push and learn new skills, learn or reiterate things that I know I can do well, but unfortunately at that time didn't get to do it. So that's that's one thing I'd employ for others to do. It would be if they've had struggles in schools or any ventures in life, it's not that they do not understand. It's that they've not been taught in a way they can comprehend. And an example that I've always used or stuck with me was there was a physicist called was it Richard Feynman, and everyone who worked with him used to go on about the reason that he was so good is that he could convey physics and teach it to a fly. So... That's that's a good analogy. We can learn it. We we'll keep continually learning through life, um, through our events. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's good. It's a good mindset to have because I and you know I'll I kind of reflect back on you know life generally, but I'm going to use personal training as an example. And we kind of touched on you know getting your degree or sorry getting your qualification and what have you, and then um, starting up your your first PT job. To be fair, I was kind of. Um, what was I early twenties at that stage? And I, you know, I come back, come from a bit of a, a background in sports science and that sort of stuff. And I thought I knew everything that I needed to know about exercise programming and how to work with people and nutrition and anatomy and all this kind of stuff. And is it called a Dunning Kruger effect? I think when you think you kind of know everything, but the reality is you know very little. <laughs> and I think just over the years, I've seen more and more actually yeah i i know so little but you could see that in a negative sense and be like okay i i I recognize actually i don't know as much as i know i I thought i knew but i'm going to carry on this facade of like yeah i i got it all together i know all my stuff you know or you can see it in a positive sense and and see it as an opportunity to learn more and continually do that i think that mindset that growth mindset i suppose if we want to use that sort of term is is uh, obviously a very, very helpful and preferable choice. Definitely. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect is quite an interesting topic. It's depicted in like a bell curve. Effectively, you'll never know as much as what you think you do. So it becomes more a point of acceptance that you know <laughs> very little. From being the undergrad anyway, it's you think you know more than you do and you're like, oh God. Yeah, definitely. And it's a good place to be as well to recognise that. Thanks so much, uh, Reese, for your time today. I, I 
tend to finish these interviews with a couple of questions to help people potentially think a, a little bit and reflect on on their situation, you know, if they're someone who's finding themselves in a, a difficult spot at the moment. So the first question is, what advice would you give to men who are pot- potentially in that difficult place and they're hesitant to seek help? The obvious one is speak to somebody who genuinely cares. The other part of advice, though, would be is while you're waiting for help, Pick one thing you're good at or you enjoy and that is meaning-making, something you can orientate into a goal and move towards it because you've got a path and part of your story to move forwards. Now, even if it isn't the path that you finish with, what you'll learn along the way, having a sense of direction, you're going to pick up a lot of benefits rather than staying stagnant, just waiting, being patient. So that would be my one bit of advice. Pick something you love, you enjoy, and go for it. Yeah, that's that's some quality advice. Really, really, really good. I love that. Certainly something that, you know, um, gives a bit of almost purpose, I guess, in life when, when the times get tough because you can kind of lose that a little bit. So by drawing your attention to that or, or reflecting on it and, and defining that one thing can help to regain a, a sense of purpose. The, the final question that we finish off with is what one word would you use to describe a strong man and why? I think one word that's perhaps a bit different would be adaptive. There's a few, you know, versatile, resilient, but adaptive purely because it's inevitable the experiences that unfold in their life, but it gives you the confidence if you're adaptive to extrapolate those events and pick something positive that happens. So people we think physically strong, but the one who's adaptive to their surroundings, their events, and are able to still move forward, I think that's strong, regardless what mental health affects them. It's the disabilities and situations and vicissitudes that we inevitably face in life that we can opt to be adaptable and learn from or we can be in dismay, stay stagnant, ruminate, and become better. That's brilliant. There's so much power and belief, and actually, when we can move away from this place of like, you know, I'm stuck, I'm hopeless, I'm worthless, and move to a place where, okay, actually, I realize that there are things within my control, there are things that I can do, there are positive steps I can make, both in terms of of uh, my my mindset perhaps or in terms of my lifestyle like just actually understanding or, or or affirming to yourself like i have power to actually make change here that in itself can be such a positive step forward especially for people who have been stuck in this place where they they do feel like they're limited by mental health issues or uh, perhaps in, in disabilities as well um yeah i think that is absolutely massive yeah i completely agree with you there um we have the power to make the change. That's why one of the other tenets was I had was perseverance over patience. It's effectively what you just described there. We use our values, our beliefs, but we set the plan in motion, create a positive snowball effect. Because we need to be patient for change, but too much patience leads to stagnation without pragmatic planning. And reaching out for help, reaching with somebody who knows some goal setting, any factors to move forwards. We at least know if we're doing one thing better than yesterday, we're still moving. Which, you know, I, I love. That's what I like about your work as well. Thanks for that. That's uh, it's really been really good to chat to you, and you've given a lot of great insight, a lot for us <laughs> to reflect on. Yeah. <laughs> and I've absolutely loved chatting to you. I could absolutely talk more uh, about this. I could talk for uh, probably another couple of hours, but. Uh, I'm not going to do that because I'm trying to keep the episode uh, length <laughs> down a little bit. <laughs> oh, it's just, I feel sorry for your viewers. I spoke that much, so I'll get sick of it and turn it off straight away. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. Not at all. You're too hard on yourself. That was It was a really enjoyable interview, and as I say, could have gone on longer, but I will call it a day there. Um, before I do that, however, though, if you want to just take some time to kind of t- tell people a little bit more about what you do or remind people what more a little more about what you do and also if they're interested in learning more about you and your work then uh, how can they connect with you or find you so the easiest would be my social media 
I think Instagram is the one I use the most. It's uh, Burn R Fit Coaching, which is all my personal training things, but I still keep a lot of my personal views on it as well. That would be the easiest. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I would highly, highly recommend you you drop him a follow. I really uh, love seeing all your posts. The personal ones as well as the the sort of more professional <laughs> ones too. It's really, really interesting. Yeah. And I'll, I'll do learn a lot from from you. Um, and it's, yeah, it's so good to see or to, to know that there are other coaches in the fitness industry who share a lot of the same passion and drive and um, want to really help those people uh, with their mental health as well as their physical health. It's really, really awesome. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, we'll wrap things up. Um, take care, Reese. Thanks very much. That's no problem. See you again soon. A huge thank you to Reese for joining us on the Strongman podcast and finding some time to talk through some really, really important topics. Some of that was really quite tough listening to to hear in particular about his experiences with epilepsy and just the the challenges and as he referred to that lack of freedom that he has in life uh, as a result of it but also to see how he has almost like reframed it and moves forward and, and doesn't allow that disability to determine his life and define him. It was really inspirational and I'm very grateful to have had him on to discuss those really important topics. There were so many great bits of knowledge and insight there from from Reese, which will absolutely go a long way when it comes to improving our physical and mental strength and resilience. What really stood out for me when chatting to Reese there in the interview was just how measured he is. And this is something, this is a skill that I am absolutely trying to work on and he certainly seems to have down to a T. It's just taking some time to respond, to actually really listen and I left in, when I, in the editing process, I left in one example of that where he was just like, I need to take a breath and think through it and then respond. So often it's sort of intuitive just to immediately respond without thinking. Um, and also what won't have been reflected again because of, because of the editing process is just the amount of space taken between words and sentences and yeah, just finding that time in conversation. It made it very easy to talk to him and also clearly gave him the space to articulate things really well. And also the fact he was saying that, you know, this is my first podcast and I don't feel like I'm maybe verbalizing things well. I was, but for me, it was like, wow, like this is your first podcast and this is the content you're coming out with and this is how you're conveying things. It was, yeah, it was quite something. I really, really enjoyed that. Very quickly, just to clarify as well, because there was a little bit of feedback uh, from the microphone when he was reading out his Instagram handle. It's burner underscore fit coaching. So that's burner as in B-Y-R-N-E-R underscore fit coaching. And you can find him there. So make sure to give him a follow. Now, if you're listening to this episode before Friday the 13th, 2023, then you have an opportunity to respond to our conversation today. Next Tuesday, which is the 10th of October, is World Mental Health Day. And next week will also be five years since I started my business, which is absolutely incredible. I, I have no idea where these five years have gone. Um, I'm very, very grateful though to still be to be running my own business it, it's uh, been touch and go at some some points thanks very much covid but yeah five years which is amazing so in light of these two things i'm actually going to be running a number of events next week and one of those things is that on friday the 13th myself and reese will be going live on instagram we'll do a, a question and answer session so if if you have any questions that you would like to ask either of us or both of us then please do make sure to check out my Instagram page and also Reese's one as well. So I'm at the Wellbeing PT, and yeah, you know Reese's one by now. And of course, if there's anything from this interview today that you think uh, you would love to know more about, then this is such a great opportunity for you to do exactly that. Alternatively, you can send your questions in via email. You can email me tsm at the Wellbeing PT dot com. 
Now that is just one of three events that I'm going to be running in that week. The other two events are as follows. Firstly, Tuesday the 10th of October, I am running a free well-being workout at Energy Gym in Edinburgh. This is going to be a strength-based circuit. It's going to be from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And if you want to sign up, again, check my Instagram, click the link in my bio and you can sign up that way. And the following day, Wednesday the 11th of October, I will be doing a free webinar entitled One Rep at a Time. In the presentation, I'll be giving you a very brief introduction. We'll be talking about the connections between the mind and the body. We'll consider how we might overcome common barriers. Reflect on the theme of World Mental Health Day, which is mental health as a human right. And then I'll also give you some exciting updates in terms of my business and what I would like to achieve over the next five years. And that will also be starting at 6 p.m. So just to be clear and summarize everything, Tuesday the 10th of October, we have the Wellbeing Workout at Energy Gym. Wednesday the 11th, we have one rep at a time. And then on the Friday, we have a question and answer with myself and Reese. I would be absolutely delighted to see you there and to celebrate these events with you. I'll pop some information into the episode description and should you have any questions don't hesitate get in contact and i'll get back to you as soon as i can okay now that's all done and out the way it's time to move on to the final brain break of the series this is the part of the show that is designed to give your brain a break rather than break your brain and very simply we are just being kind of light-hearted covering different topics typically kind of silly ones to give your brain a bit of rest after some some heavy conversations. Now, last time we defined this week's Brain Break topic to be unpopular opinions. And the reason for that is because we kicked off the show with a very unpopular opinion. My very first Brain Break was basically that Friends is kind of shite and uh, it's massively overrated, which did get a lot of, of kickback from uh, the masses. But you can fight me. It is shite. So... I thought it would be a nice way to round everything off by returning back to that initial theme. Uh, and I was this time asking you for your unpopular opinions. And I got three responses, two of which, um, how do I put this? Two of which really makes me question whether I have safe people in my life. And you'll understand the seriousness of them uh, when I share them in a moment. Actually, I got that wrong. There weren't three, there were four. So we've got four unpopular opinions to share, two of which are still offensive, specifically to me. And yeah, I'm hurt. So we'll go through the first couple which weren't offensive to me. And the first one we have is Suzuka is an overrated track in Formula One and Abu Dhabi's track isn't as bad as people make out. Now, I'll be honest, I have no interest in F1 at all. So... I don't really have any idea of whether or not this is a controversial opinion. I'm a motorbike guy. I've w tried to watch F1 before and it's incredibly boring. Uh, that's maybe my unpopular opinion, actually. F1 is boring. It's, it's yeah, yeah, that's, there we go. There's, there's my one for the week. I just feel like F1's more about strategy. Like, and there's, there, there's a high number of laps and you're just watching the cars going round and round and round and round and round in a circle. And... There's not much action, not very much. There's not many overtakes or crashes or what have you, certainly from the races I've seen over the years. Whereas MotoGP is crazy. Like, you have people getting wiped out, you have these most spectacular crashes where you're wondering how are you actually walking after that. You have overtaking happening pretty much every lap. Anyone can win the race. Whereas I feel like with F1, it's just like the same teams or the same driver winning constantly. Um, yeah, so MotoGP is definitely the winner for me. I do understand the enjoyment of, of F1, but I've just found MotoGP to be way more engaging and far more exciting. And that's kind of made F1 seem a little bit pathetic. Yeah, that is a really unpopular opinion. F1 is pathetic. Let's run with that. The next unpopular opinion was deadlifts also ain't bad for you, but anyone who suggests burpees needs a therapist. Quick stat. And, um... Yes, th this is very true. I, I don't think this is necessarily an opinion anymore. Uh, deadlifts are not bad for you. Um, they're not going to fuck your back up like a lot of people are scared of. Uh, even if you are rounding your back slightly 
in a deadlift, that's not necessarily going to cause an injury. Yeah, I'm not going to get into that because this is meant to be lighthearted and I can see it, I can see myself going down a serious route. So I'm going to stop there. But yeah, I agree with burpees as well. Like, whoever came up with burpees is an absolute psychopath and they're, they're a disgrace to the fitness industry and should never work. They should, they should be expelled from the fitness industry for coming up with that absolute monstrosity. Now we'll move on to, yeah, let's move on to these two. Um, and I'll try and keep my composure. Now you may know that I have quite a sweet tooth um, and I have a, a, a particular affinity for squashies. Now I, I don't care about the variations of it but the original drumstick squashies are the best sweet in existence, right? No doubt. G give me an example of something that's better. Exactly, you can't. But someone responded to say that Squashies aren't all that. Squashies aren't all that. That's that's like heresy. That's heresy in these parts. I'm hurt and I will never forget this moment. How dare you? How dare you suggest that? Anyway, um, moving on. The next one was was still offensive. It's not quite as bad. That was the squashies one was the worst. But the next one was sticky toffee pudding is overrated. Okay, like I can understand where you're coming from to a degree. Like if you're going for to weddings or celebrations or restaurants, sticky toffee pudding is like a very common one. So you get it quite a lot, I guess. If if you're going out and about and what have you. But come on, it's it's so good. It tastes unbelievable most of the time i don't think i've ever sat down had a sticky toffee pudding and thought i didn't enjoy that do you know what i mean so i get yeah unpopular opinions and that that certainly is an unpopular one so yeah you've 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 fulfilled the assignment uh and i can certainly forgive you for that but the squashies one no 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 i think i need to go and take a wee lie down actually i'll be back in a minute Hello. Right, I'm back. So, just gonna wrap up the episode and wrap up the series, sadly, with some exciting news about the strongmen. So, I've been doing a lot of work in the background, just working on the group to try and firstly understand how I can better serve the guys, but also reach other people and get others involved. I put out some market research recently which has been incredibly helpful so I'm going to take on board a lot of the responses and make some changes in terms of how the group runs and also how I talk and market the group itself. Now I can't go into too much depth on that at the moment because I'll be honest it's still very much a work in progress however what is going to change and what I'm very confident is going to happen come January 2024 is that I'm going to create a six week introductory strongman course so at the moment if you're not aware we do have a group of guys that meet up twice a month once virtually online where we take some time just to catch up and have a bit of a discussion and a second time in the gym working on building physical strength now this group is going to continue and we're going to continue with the same structure so we have these two monthly events the six week program is to coincide with the ongoing group so once those in the course have finished the six weeks there will then be an option to continue working with the strongmen. I'm also working behind the scenes on an educational element as well which is really really exciting. Once again very much a work in progress still but the timeline currently is to have everything set and ready to go for January 2024. There is however still three months left of this year. The strongmen in the meantime are still meeting so we had our Thrive event this week. This is the virtual call where the guys have an opportunity to share a little bit about what's been going on, get a bit of a catch up, have a bit of a laugh and just generally discuss um, whatever's on their mind. So this week we were talking a lot about stress, how stress actually tends to manifest itself in each of us and then what we do 
in order to help us deal with stress. It was a really, really interesting conversation and I'm, I gained a lot from it and I'm in no doubt the members of the group also gained much from it. We'll also be meeting again later in the month for a build session. As I say, this is the gym based session, so we're really looking forward to that. And these events will repeat themselves once again in November and December. So if you're interested in coming along to these events or knowing a little bit more, what I would highly recommend is joining the Strong Men WhatsApp group. To do that, either contact me directly through social media or feel free to send me an email, tsm at thewellbeingpt.com. I'm very excited about the plans that I have for the Strong Men as we approach 2024. I'm in no doubt that this group has the potential to grow and expand and really help a lot of guys build physical and mental strength and resilience and you can be a part of that. So be sure to keep up to date with the very latest on the strong men by following me on social media or as I say make sure to get involved with the WhatsApp group. And sadly ladies and gents, well primarily gents, that is the last episode of the series which is a bit sad. I've really enjoyed the variety of guests that we've had over the last 10 episodes. It's been such an incredible experience for me to chat with all of these guys to create this podcast, which is something I've never done before. I've gained so much from it and I hope you have too. Series 2 will be coming in time, but it will look a little different. I'm not going to go into the same amount of detail as I have with the Strongman Group. You're just going to have to wait and see. But thank you once again, thanks to every single one of you who has taken some time to check out the episodes, to leave me a review, to contribute to the brain break. I'm really grateful for you all and for the opportunity to do this work. So until next time, take good care of yourself.